Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Welcome back to another 1-400 scale diecast model aircraft review of this from NG Next Generation Models, the Boeing 737-800, seen here in 1-400 scale in Aeroflot colors. The Boeing 737, it is one of the longest serving commercial airliners still in active service today. First flying in 1967, yes, all the way back there, mid 20th century, the aircraft is still very much a fixture of commercial aviation today. First entering service in 1968 with launch customer Lufthansa, the 737 series has gone through many different variants and design iterations over those more than 50 years in active commercial service. This variant of the 737-800 comes from the penultimate generation of the aircraft. Currently, the latest version of the 737 is the much-troubled 737 MAX series. This, however, is not a MAX. This one comes from the NG, next generation variant of the 737, which first came into service in the late 90s. 1997 was when the NG generation of the 737 debuted, and it comprised many different variants of the 737 in that overall generation. We had the Dash 600, 700, 800, and 900 ER that all debuted as part of that next generation scheme from Boeing heading into the turn of the 21st century. This is the Dash 800. It's the uh, second largest, I suppose you could say, of the next generation variants of the 737. Of course, the Dash 900 being the uh, top of that line. But the Dash 800 is in widespread commercial service to this day, despite being in introduced about 25 years ago now. Many regional carriers and even some longer range carriers around the world, they make great use of the NG variants of the 737. And of course here, Aeroflot flying a few of them as well in their colors. It is a short to medium range jet airliner. We've got twin jet engines there mounted under the wing. So pretty typical in terms of what we see in modern design. But of course, modern design was very much spurred by the 737 in its initial Dash 100 and Dash 200 configurations because this was really one of the first regional jet airliners that ever came onto the market. I mean, 1967, the jet age only really began about 10 years prior to that. So it was very much an idea of the industry still trying to figure out what it was going to be in the transition from prop to jet power and Boeing came out with the 737 and it became really the design architect type for all jet airliners, both regional and long haul airliners that came after it. And of course, the 737 itself, it has seen quite a storied service history and it seems to be one that's not quite ending yet. From NG, what do we have here in 1-400 scale? Well, we've got an absolutely great model. Let's take a closer look at it. Before we take a closer look at the model, let's take a look at the box from whence it comes. Coming in here from screen right, there we are. There it is, the NG Next Generation Model Aeroflot box, Boeing 737-800 up there at the top center. And then, of course, we've got a rendering of the aircraft here. The rendering is a little bit bigger than the actual model, but uh, of course, this being a reasonably small model here, the 737-800 being a reasonably small aircraft in 1-400 scale, you get a sense of the size constraints there. But nonetheless, nice crisp rendering of the aircraft. Looks to be computer generated, but looks good nonetheless. Only differs from the actual model in terms of size, and of course, landing gear shown here retracted. But there you go, we have got the Aeroflot emblem as well as the titles there. Lower right of the box, NG Next Generation Model, 1-400 scale collectible models, die cast metal, and then of course the bottom left, Aeroflot Rossiskia Avialinia is what it says there in Cyrillic, that's Russian Airlines, the registration on the aircraft, Victor, Papa, Bravo, Mike, Oscar, and then of course your Boeing, officially licensed product 737, produced under license, Boeing and 737, the distinctive Boeing logos, product markings, and trade dress are trademarks of the Boeing company. Yes. Bottom panel, there we go, 737-800NG, another rendering of the aircraft, and then we have got an inventory number here from the distributor, that's not an NG thing, and our registration reiterated. Coming down for the right side panel, 737-800NG, Aeroflot, and then 1400 scale collectible models, die cast metal. Top panel, same as the bottom panel here, but we do not have our distributor sticker there. So we have the complete rendering of the aircraft once again, and the left side once again. This is the flap from which I opened the box. All well and good. 
The back of the box, NG in the upper left, another rendering of the aircraft. Basically, it looks identical to the front panel, but uh, we do have our disclaimers here. We also have our Aeroflot licensing and trademark things there. Item number 58019 for those of you keeping score. And then, of course, our warnings for the small parts and sad onions for children 0 to 14. There we go. It is 14 plus product of China. Yeah. There's no look inside tab or anything on these NG boxes, not like you get on the Gemini models or even some of the Herpa models, but uh, yes, very nice box art, I've got to say, and of course, as NG generally do, they are trying to imitate the livery of the aircraft here with their box art, and uh, I say that they have done a very nice job, and of course, as we come in on the model itself, you can quite see the resemblance between the model and the box, which is, of course, by design, and I've got to say, pretty well executed design at that. The Boeing 737, it is far from a new aircraft. In fact, it is one of the oldest aircraft that remains in production today. The 737 has gone through quite a number of updates and refits and completely different models yielding almost completely different aircraft in some cases over the years. However, the 737 as the overall type first flew on April 9th, 1967. So this aircraft is well over 50 years old at this point in terms of being the overall design that it is, although later variants of it, the Dash 800 included, hail from much more recent times. But the type as the monolith that it has become first flew in 1967 and it had its service introduction on the 10th of February 1968 with Lufthansa. They were the launch customer for the 737-100 as it was at the time, the initial variants of the 737 being the Dash 100 and Dash 200. Being produced between 1966 and the present day, 66 of course before the first flight, but that's when Boeing had launched the aircraft and started to open it up for orders from customers. 10,584 of these have been produced as of October 2020, and of course the production line remains open for the 737. It's an absolute stalwart aircraft. And, of course, it looks a bit different nowadays from, it, from how it did in its Dash 100 and Dash 200 variants. This one is the 737NG, next generation variant of the 737, which included a whole slew of different 737 variants. This was a variant that uh, was launched in 1996 in terms of opening up to production the NG variant, the Dash 800 that this is, but the NG overall first flew on February 9th, 1997, and it was introduced into service with Southwest Airlines, surprise, surprise, on January, on December, rather, December 17th, 1997. So the NG remains in service, and a couple of the Dash 200 and Dash 300 737s also remain in service today. However, the primary users of the Dash 800 variant, as we can see here, Southwest Airlines, Ryanair, United Airlines, and American Airlines. Of course, Aeroflot, as we see the aircraft here in Aeroflot colors, also a user of the NG, next generation versions of the 737. That NG designation, the next generation designation of the 737, it includes several variants. It includes the Dash 600, 700, 800, and 900 ER variants of the 737. They do, of course, share a lot of common components and a lot of common specifications. However, the Dash 800, as we see it here, it reads a little bit like this in terms of its overall specifications. Overall passenger capacity in terms of the exit limit on the Dash 800 airframe is 189. And of course, um, the actual variants of this in terms of the actual cabin configurations will vary from, ca from carrier to carrier in terms of how they want their cabin to be configured. But the exit limit for the airframe, 189. Overall length of the aircraft, 129 feet 6 inches. The height of the aircraft from the bottom of the main gear to the top of the tail is 41 feet 2 inches. Inches. The wingspan, and we have a few different wing configurations available on the NG737s. The overall wingspan, though, as we see it here with the winglets, 117 feet 5 inches or 35.79 meters. Total wing area is 1,341.2 square feet or 124.6 square meters. The wings are swept back at 25 degrees from the center point of the wing root there, and the aspect ratio on the wing is 9.44. 
Overall fuselage width is 12 feet 4 inches on all variants of the 737 Next Generation, the Dash 800 included. The cabin width 11 feet 7 inches and the overall cabin height is 86.6 inches or 2.2 meters. Of course that is the habitable space inside the cabin in terms of the pressurized passenger volume. Operating empty weight on the Dash 800 is 91,300 pounds or 41,413 kilograms. The maximum landing weight, 146,300 pounds, that's 66,361 kilograms. And the maximum takeoff weight, 174,200 pounds or 79,016 kilograms. Overall fuel capacity on the Dash 800 is 6,875 U.S. gallons or 26,022 liters. Overall cargo deck, this is the lower deck volume there for cargo only, is 1,555 cubic feet or 44.1 cubic meters. At maximum takeoff weight, we'll use 7,598 feet of runway, that's 2,316 meters. And our cruising altitude there being 41,000 feet in terms of our service ceiling with our cruising speed being 0.82 Mach. That is 470 knots or 871 kilometers per hour. Generally, the cruising speed will be a little bit lower at 0 0.78, 0 0.79 Mach, but it can go all the way up to 0.82 if they so need. Range on the Dash 800, that's 2,935 nautical miles or 5,436 kilometers. And that, of course, is facilitated by the twin engines mounted low under the wing on the 737, including the flattened bottom portion of the nacelle. That's there simply because the 737 sits rather low on the ground and they need that ground clearance for the engines. The engines, though, they are the CFM 56-7B24 through 27 variants of that CFM engine. And, of course, that is a big departure from the initial variants of the Pratt & Whitney engines that would have been fitted to the first generations of the 737. The CFM 56 engines, they yield anywhere between 24,000 and 27,000 pound-feet of thrust at sea level at toga power. That's 110 to 120 kilonewtons at sea level. Maximum climb thrust, though, in terms of what we're going to be getting there, is going to be 59 5,960 pound-feet. That's a climb power there, not toga power. In terms of the overall engine dimensions, they're 61 inches in diameter. That's 155 centimeters, and the engines are 103 and a half inches long. That's 263 centimeters. Engine ground clearance, as we talked about there, they're 19 inches off the ground. That's 48 centimeters. So, of course, on the 737s, this has necessitated, at least through the NG series of the 737, that's necessitated the flattened out nacelles there, the bottom of the uh, nacelles, they are flat, to ensure a little bit more ground clearance. So that's what we've got here. We have got a short to medium range, narrow body, twin engine airliner. It's not at all in keeping with what, with what we've been seeing with uh, later design generations in terms of the 737 MAX. That's essentially a different aircraft. It's basically a 737 in name only. They've stretched out the fuselage, they have elongated the wings, they've beefed up the engine capacity, and they're trying to increase range and efficiency while increasing that range as well to be more in keeping with aircraft like the Airbus A330 and Airbus A350, although we've seen the trouble that Boeing has had bringing the 737 MAX into commercial service, but uh, hopefully we'll be seeing that aircraft reclaiming the skies in the next few months to come. The recertification process is effectively complete. The aircraft has been ungrounded, at least in the United States, on the part of the FAA, and we'll see what happens with the rest of the world as well. A couple of very high-profile accidents featuring the 737 MAX have happened, but this one is not a MAX. This is the next generation variant, so the last variant prior to the MAX here, the Dash 800 specifically, and these have been in service for about 25 years now with very few problems overall, it must be said. Now looking at this one for the model that it is, what do we have here? NG, they really have come on strong in the last couple of years in terms of their build quality, their paint, and their printed graphics. Everything has just steadily gotten better and better from these guys, and this 737-800 is no exception to that general trend. 
initially the construction of this thing it, it's very striking in terms of its quality although this is a very small piece in one four hundred scale it's only about four and a half inches long but the construction is very solid. It is die cast throughout. We have very nice paint. We have very nice graphics and overall just good build quality. The wings are actually rooted into the fuselage. It's not a cradle arrangement like you've seen on some other models from other manufacturers. This thing is very nicely put together. It's all solid. Everything is nicely mounted. Everything is straight. Nothing is crooked that shouldn't be crooked. And we've even got very nice antenna details across the top of the fuselage as well, rendered in three dimensions. So it all looks very, very nice. To get in a little bit more closely toward the nose section, what have we got here? There it is. Everything is very nicely shaped. That is the correct shape of the nose on the 737. It's a very distinctive nose shape, but is rendered very nicely. You can see the shut line there across the nose of the aircraft, behind the nose cone where the radar array is, and of course that would be a removable section of non-structural fuselage for servicing those radar components. Very nice. And, of course, nice rendering of the nose gear as well. And, of course, all the landing gear on this model do roll quite nicely, it must be said. Very small scale, again, but they took the time to do all of that correctly, especially in terms of the rolling gear. It looks very, very nice. Of course, you can get a sense of the graphics around the nose area as well. You can see that we have got the flag of the Russian Federation, of course, Aeroflot being the flag carrier for Russia, very nicely modeled. We've also got the Sky Team graphics there, just a rears of the left side cockpit windows. Very nice. Additionally, we've got our graphics for our L1 door with the uh, little hardware rendered, at least in print, that uh, would be required to open and close the door. That all looks nice. And of course, we've got some pitot arrays and static ports as well along the forward port side of the fuselage. Very, very nicely done. We can get in a little bit more close there and uh, try and get our focus back. Nope, that's not going to happen. But we have got nicely rendered title graphics there. Arrow flut, very good. And then, of course, moving along the port side of the fuselage, moving arrears, you can see our engine nacelles. And, of course, they do have that trademark flattened out lower section of the nacelle just to ensure ground clearance and to try and keep the engines from kicking up any FOD debris on the ground. Of course, uh, that goes a long way to keeping the flight line and uh, generally the runways clear of obstructions and keeping, of course, the aircraft safe. But that all looks very nice. Moving the rears, we have got our leading edge of the port wing with our winglet there, and we have got our red strobe there on the port wing tip, just uh, inboard of the, of the little uh, winglet there. It looks good. And then moving the rears to the tail cone, we've got our fairing in front of the vertical stabilizer. It's something that was added in later variants of the 737 to uh, improve the aerodynamic efficiency a little bit and cut down on flow separation to maintain rudder authority. That all looks very nice. We've got our overwing exit doors there, which we'll take a closer look at later on from above. We've got our registration there in the tail cone, and we have got our rearmost boarding door as well. I guess we could call that our L2 door. Looks good. Horizontal stabilizer, leading edge of the port side of which we can see there, looking nice. And we also have some nice silver detailing there on the leading edge of the vertical stabilizer. But from this angle, all in all, looks very, very convincing, I must say. Nicely put together model so far from NG. Take a look at the aircraft from nose on. You can see how squarely it is sitting on the ground. All the landing gear do appear to be straight and level. We don't have any extraneous roll dialed in here on the ground. Looks very good. And again, you can see the uh, flat portion of the nacelles there at their lower side, again, for ground clearance. But it all looks very, very nice, as uh, does just generally the overall proportion of the aircraft. Looks phenomenal, I've got to say. A little bit difficult to get in at close range there on the nose section, but as it comes back into focus, you can see the disposition of the cockpit windows there with the window glazing. Looks good. And of course, the uh, nose gear there underneath. You can also see the landing gear doors in their open position. I really like what they've done there on the nose gear doors. So they, they look correct. They look really, really good. And uh, again, the detail work at this scale, those doors are only maybe two millimeters long. And of course, in their in their cross-section here, facing uh, 
from nose on. They're much more narrow than that even, but uh, they look good. They took the time to model that and they executed very, very well. Additionally, on this shot, we'll also be able to see into the engines. There we go. You can see the engine fan blade detail. Obviously very small, but it's all very nicely recognizable. Of course, it's all static here given the scale constraints, but it all looks very nice. Nicely appointed. Our wings here, here's the starboard wing, the leading edge of which we can see. Nice profile there, and it's all straight across. Nothing appears to be crooked or bent or anything like that, and it just integrates very smoothly into the outboard winglet there, the end fence of the wing, just trying to cut down on excess spillage over the uh, wing tip there to increase the overall effective area of the wing in terms of the area of the wing that's generating lift. Looks very, very good, and of course we also do have a green strobe there on the starboard wing tip. Very nice. Moving across the uh, top of the fuselage toward the rear, you can see we do have some antennas visible there, and we'll take a closer look freehand later on to get a better look at them. But uh, we do have the antenna details visible across the top of the fuselage, and then going into the overall proportion of the empennage. We've got our horizontal and vertical stabilizers plainly visible there, and they all look to be sitting straight, level, and true. No problems there in terms of anything being crooked or loose. Definitely looks very, very nice and uh, very pleased with this one. Despite the small size of the model, they've done a very nice job in putting everything together, and it looks very, very convincing as a 737. Starboard side of the aircraft now, getting a little bit closer in, move toward the nose. There we go. There's the nose area, and again, you can see that they have rendered the nose shape very nicely on this one. You see that little bump around the cockpit windows? That all looks very nice, and it looks pretty correct. And of course, you can see across the nose section, the shut line between the fuselage proper and the radar dome assembly cover there. We've also got our pedo arrays there just on the lower right side of the nose there, just below the cockpit windows. You can see those three ports there for your air data sensors. To uh, the rear of that, we've got a Russian flag and the name of the aircraft as well. Sky Team logo just the rears of the cockpit windows here on the starboard side as well, so that's on both sides. And then we have got our R1 door. Arrears of that, we have got our cabin windows. They start to come in. The first two are blanked out, but they are still there. And of course, we also have some static ports below the first couple of rows of the forward cabin windows. We also have our Aeroflot title graphics here in Latin script. They're in Cyrillic on the other side of the aircraft, but very nice. Of course, they're saying the same thing. Below all of that, we have got our cargo door, our forward cargo door, the shut line for which you can see rendered there, and of course a couple of uh, other service static ports there. We also have our ventral antenna, our forward ventral antenna. We have two other ventral antennas on this aircraft, but they're all rendered very nicely, and you can see that they are rendered in three dimensions. They're not just printed on in two dimensions. They are separate pieces that have been applied later on in the assembly process, and they all look well and good. I do like that. Moving your rears toward midships, you can see overwing exits here on the starboard side. That all looks nice, and you can also see the uh, two dorsal antennas over the top of the fuselage looking nice. Main landing gear as well, very good. We don't really have landing gear doors on the main gear on the 737. We do have smaller fairing doors, I suppose you can call them, that cover up the struts when the gear are retracted, but the actual wheel and tire assembly, they fold up flat into the bottom of the fuselage and they remain exposed to the elements. And uh, again, because the 737 sits so low on the ground, to have those doors there would actually reduce the ground clearance of the aircraft even more. So it was decided long ago in the initial design phase of the initial variants of the 737 that we wouldn't have doors on the main landing gear. And of course, the aircraft has been flying in service for over 50 years at this point without them. So not really required. Additionally, you can see the little canoes, the fairings that cover up some of the actuation armature for the trailing edge flaps on the lower side of the starboard wing here. Of course, the port wing would be all identical in a mirrored profile, but you can see all of that. That all looks very nice. Toward the rear, we can see the uh, termination of our cabin windows, our cargo door here for the aft cargo hold, and then, of course, we've got our L2 door. 
Additionally, here with the empennage, you can see the tail cone, that nice curving shape as it moves up rather abruptly to terminate there at the extreme rear of the aircraft. And we also have our vertical and horizontal stabilizers rendered here. Very, very nice. Also, you can see how the uh, flag of the Russian Federation here featuring prominently on the tail, but you can see how it's integrated into that reddish-orange cheat line that separates the uh, silver and blue upper and lower sections of the livery. And that starts all the way here at the nose, and as we move a rear, as you can see how the flag just sort of sprouts out of that cheat line into the tail section. That looks very, very nice. And uh, obviously, it's a very smart-looking livery in reality, but uh, NG here reproducing it at 1 400th scale, they've done an absolutely amazing job having all of that line up absolutely perfectly. I can see no discernible break, at least in terms of where the cheat line ends and the flag begins. Looks very, very nice, and it has a very nice effect. Additionally, here on the uh, tail section of the aircraft, just above the registration, you can see that red rectangular section. That is for rescue crews, specifically fire rescue crews on the ground, should they need to punch a hole into the fuselage to extinguish a fire on the inside. That's one of the areas that they could cut into the fuselage to gain access either for their firefighting equipment or in an extreme situation to get people into the aircraft if for some reason the exits could not be opened. That's uh, an interesting detail there that uh, NG obviously have replicated. And then obviously we have got our registration reiterated here as well. Victor, Papa, Bravo, Mike, Alpha. Very cool. Finally, here on the tail cone, you can see just a rears of that R2 door. You can see that we have got a little naked duct and intake for the auxiliary power unit, which of course is sitting in the tail cone of the aircraft. And of course, that terminates there with the APU exhaust at the extreme rear of the aircraft. But all in all, again, looking very, very nice. Quite pleased with this offering from NG. It looks absolutely marvelous. Having a look from the tail of the 737, here we are, coming in a little bit more closely on it. All right, there we go. You can see the overall proportion of the empennage from O'Rears as well as the uh, top section of the wings there, the upper surface of the wings, and you can see some of the uh, graphics printing there required for the overwing exits. And of course, you'll see that a whole lot better from above in due course. But rear sides of the main landing gear, you can see the struts there, the gear in their extended position looks good, and you can see those little sort of fairing doors that serve an aerodynamic purpose just to try and conceal the struts on the main gear when they are retracted. They look good though in their extended configuration. Additionally, you can see the trailing edges of the wings there with the little canoe pontoon nacelles there just to cover up some of the trailing edge flap armature structure there in terms of actuating those control surfaces. Looks very good. Moving outboard on the port wing, you can see again how the trailing edge of the wing also integrates very nicely into the end fence there, the little winglet. And of course, that is also the same on the starboard wing, as you can see there. Additionally, the exhaust sides of the engines. We have some detailing there on the exhaust sides of the engines in terms of the cone structure. However, uh, obviously there's no visible bypass there. There's no visible gap between the engine nacelle and uh, to, to be able to look through the initial fan blades on the forward portion of the engine, simply because we have got very small scale constraints here. But they look very, very nice nonetheless. Also, I do like the pylons uh, to which you can see the engines are mounted on the uh, lower side of the wing. Looks very good indeed. Additionally, the empennage structure from the tail. You can see a little bit of the uh, shut line there between the uh, structures, particularly the uh, vertical stabilizer as it integrates into the fuselage. But by and large, it looks very good. Nothing looks disproportionate or out of place, and certainly nothing looks like it's loose or crooked on this model. Looks absolutely wonderful. And the port side of the aircraft from edge on here, looking very good. Moving toward the nose section once again. There it is. Looks good. Aeroflot title graphics in Cyrillic once again. However, looks good. You can also see the Aeroflot emblem there below the A and the E there. Looking good. Additionally, 
Similar details to what we saw before from our three-quarter angle shot from nose on, but there you are. Shot line from the radar dome to the rest of the fuselage, cockpit windows, we got our Sky Team logo there, our rears of the cockpit windows, the flag of the Russian Federation with the name of the aircraft rendered, and then we have got our static ports there along the forward lower section of the fuselage. L1 door, our nose gear doors, and you can see now uh, from the side you can see the uh, rendering of that laterally, they are again very small, but again very impressive to see that they've got that detail in there. And then our ventral antennas from the uh, port side here. And additionally, our dorsal antennas look good. Over wing exits there, our engine to cell detail, our winglets there, our end fences on the wing tips, and then moving a rears toward our rear section of the aircraft with the registration, the L2 door, and then our empennage. Looks very, very good. I've got to say, if I had a if I had a background that actually looked like something and wasn't just blank white, you uh, might do a double take to say, oh, is this a picture of a real airplane? If you do it right, you'd be surprised what you could achieve there with uh, scale models and some interestingly uh, planned photography, I guess you could say. But yeah, it looks very, very nice. I do also want to point out that we do have some additional details on the engine nacelles there. You can see some hardware for uh, manual interface from the ground with the engines there, the uh, manually actuated um, bleed valves and things like that you can see. Also you can see the uh, silver portion of the initial uh, front side of the nacelle that's for our anti-ice systems on there. So that's an unpainted section that so that they can recirculate some heat from the engines and thereby the hydraulic system to uh, combat any icing on the leading edges of the engines which could disrupt flow into the engines and overall impact negatively engine performance. So all of that looks very very nice. I also just like how you can see some of the speckle work in the paint there. There's a little bit of a shimmer effect in the paint here as the light hits it from different angles. Looks very very good and uh, again looks uh, pretty true to the uh, prototype in terms of what Aeroflot's livery is looking like these days. Looks absolutely fantastic. Now going freehand a little bit so we can get somewhat more close to some of the smaller details that perhaps we couldn't see from a little bit farther out. But there's the nose section again. I love the way that the uh, that NG have modeled the shape of the nose. It looks absolutely great. Additionally here though on the windscreen you can see that we have got our wipers modeled there. Of course just painted on but they look very good and obviously identifiable as wipers. We've got our nose graphics there, we've got the shut line from the radar dome to the rest of the fuselage, and then of course we have got the flag, and then we also have the name of the aircraft, which we can just about read here. It looks like that is M. Mussorgsky, is what that would say. Obviously it's named after somebody. Cool. And then of course we have got our L1 door with our hardware on it. Static port and looks like uh, an angle of attack sensor there as well. And then, of course, title graphics, Aeroflot Rossiskia Avialini is what that says there. Over the top of the fuselage now, we can see we have got a whole lot more detail than just the 3D antenna work that we've got. We've got a whole lot more printing up top here for other antennas, for uh, internet, satellite, phone, things like that. And, of course, we also have our cut here for rescue uh, sections here on the fuselage. Looks like we have got six of them. We've got two forward and then we have four aft. Obviously um, this area may be more prone to fire due to the galleys being back here at least on some configurations and additionally you've got uh, an aft fuel tank as well as the auxiliary power unit back there. So probably more sources for potential ignition back here so that would explain why you have got some more cut here for rescue areas. But all in all it looks very very good. The printing over top of the fuselage and of course as you can see the uh, little location beacon light there as well. Top surfaces of the wings though, look at this, we've got a lot of detail here. Obviously we've got our leading edge slat detail across the leading edge of the wing, but we also have the shut lines rendered for our spoilers, for our ailerons, as well as for our trailing edge flaps looking good. We also have our winglet there on the wing tip with the leading edge in silver looking very good. And of course we have our overwing exit details there. You can see the two panels there that would be uh, removable in case of emergency. And then you have got the arrows there uh, showing people how to exit the aircraft in uh, two single file lines there toward the trailing edge of the wing. And if they were uh, 
on the ground and you'd assume that they would be in either takeoff or landing configuration at this point so the flaps would be extended so effectively it is guiding people to slide down the flap if uh, that would be possible I'd probably uh, rather jump off of the wing there rather than slide down the extended flaps because I'd imagine there'd be some mighty sharp edges there but overall the uh, overall path for egress is marked there quite nicely upper surface of the port wing again look very similar to the starboard wing with more shot lines for our slats, flaps, and spoilers. Looks very good. Additionally, you can see the little strakes there on the engine nacelles. We just have strakes inboard on these engine nacelles, but you can see the little fin there facing toward the fuselage there. Again, just to try and smooth out flow around the uh, nacelle area to minimize drag and to generate some vortices to try and seal some of that flow around the center section of the wing there, moving toward the wing root. Looking good tail cone area again and our empennage very nice you can see the fairing ahead of the vertical stabilizer and then of course our horizontal stabilizer the upper surfaces of which feature the shut lines for the control surfaces for our elevator control looks good and then of course we have got our vertical stabilizer which has the shut line for the rudder control surface very very nice um, there is a little bit of the uh, trim arc area there visible on the tail cone so that the Horizontal stabilizer could pitch fore and aft there for trim. Looks good. Looking very, very good indeed. And of course, uh, just pulling out a little bit, get the uh, better proportion of the aircraft on the ground. Looking very, very good. Sits squarely on the gear. No qualms about this one. An absolute 10 out of 10 from me. Wonderfully done. 737-800 here from NG. And one final detail that I did want to show, the underside of this aircraft, and uh, we remarked about the main gear on the 737 not having doors that cover them, and you can see that. You can see the wells that the gear would retract into, very nice, as well as uh, just generally the overall disposition of the underside of the aircraft, very nice. The only real detail here is the registration reiterated on the port wing underside but that looks good and additionally just a different angle on the engine nacelles and you can see the uh, cone area of the uh, central engine exhaust and you can see some of that cheat line across the bottom of the aircraft as well very good very very good indeed the other thing that i'll point out about this model that differs somewhat from some of the others that uh, we have featured here so far there is no stand hole on this one that area is taken up by the wells that uh, the landing gear would retract into so no stand hole here so um, perhaps that restricts it a little bit in terms of display options but again all in all looks absolutely great and i can't really fault them for not having a stand hole because i don't think ng sells any stands of their own but yes, it's a very nicely done aircraft, even from the bottom. So there it was in 1 400th scale, the Boeing 737-800, brought to us from NG, Next Generation Models. NG, they really have been coming on strong in the last couple of years. Their quality has consistently gotten better and better, and with every release of theirs that I've chosen to acquire, I have been less and less disappointed with each one, although I can't really say that I've ever been disappointed so far with an NG model. The quality is really good, the paint quality is great, the graphics very nicely printed there, and of course the overall construction of the model. It is die cast throughout with our wings and uh, control surfaces in terms of the empennage there being hard mounted into the fuselage rather than as their own separate cradle arrangements that are then joined later on. Everything looks great, it fits well, nothing's crooked and everything is just very solidly mounted. Really, no complaints whatsoever about anything on this one. The only thing I would say that might have the potential to detract from it in terms of display value would be the lack of a stand mount on this one. But I can entirely understand why they chose not to put one in. Well, it's just a really small model, and it doesn't mean that you can't integrate something like that with a model in this form factor. But their choice not to put one in doesn't really detract from it in my view, but again, if you uh, have certain display configurations that you want, that you use in your layout, well, that might be something that you want to consider, but all in all, it's an absolutely wonderful model great detailing all around it in terms of the painted details as well as what's physically there in terms of add-ons like the antennas that we talked about like the landing gear doors really very nicely put together and of course the overall livery and the way that they've integrated the different elements of it looks 
really nice. There are no breaks in the paint that shouldn't be there, no paint loss anywhere, no smudging or streaking. It looks absolutely great. And of course, having the landing gear roll as well. With models of this size, it's not all that uncommon to see fixed landing gear still, but looks really, really good, and I appreciate the extra effort that they went through to make the landing gear all roll. Looks absolutely great, and again, it's a very, very high-quality piece from NG. If you were on the fence about uh, an NG737, definitely I think your concerns can be allayed here because they absolutely have hit it out of the park with this Dash 800, and again, if this is indicative of the overall quality of the 737s from NG, definitely they are going to be a safe bet whichever one you get in whichever colors you choose to get it. 10 out of 10, wonderfully put together, and uh, definitely one that I'm glad to have. It looks absolutely great. Until next time, though, I do hope that you have all enjoyed this one. Ferrari Man 601 saying thank you very much for watching, and of course, we will see you soon.